So the general layout for this session, we're going to spend um, the first uh, half hour and we're going to hear from uh, Dylan. I, I'm, I'm going to apologize to all of the presenters because I'm going to butcher names. Um, we're going to hear from Luis de Sosa, de Sosa first, um, and he's going to sort of give an overview of what this vision of a unified soil data system might look like. Um, and then we're going to pivot over to Dylan Buette. I'm sorry, the French is, is three. No, no, I really butchered that one, apparently. Uh, apologies. He will, he will graciously correct me on his uh, name pronunciation when he comes up. Um, and then finally, Megan, uh, and Dylan's going to be talking about the U.S. Um, National Natural Service Research Council soil database. And I'm also butchering that, apparently. I need a crib sheet that I did do not have in front of me. All right, moving on. Um, and Megan Wong is going to uh, call, uh, round out the presentations, um, talking about some work that her group's done out in Australia, knitting together data from multiple um, contributions uh, around the ag space. So we've got three fantastic presenters lined up. I've given them 10 minutes um, and we've got a, a two minute switch over in between. Again, each of them will have their own Slido questions. You're encouraged to switch over there and uh, give us some feedback there. Um, after that, we're going to have a panel discussion. Um, and I think we are getting large enough that I'm going to suggest that people drop their questions in the chat. And you can put the questions in chat either during the presentation and we'll jot them all down um, or during the panel discussion. And I will be moderating that. Um, and then the last half hour, we are going to be going into breakout rooms. Um, and that will give us some, uh, we've got a document and a visioning opportunity for you. So each breakout room will have the opportunity to decide whether they are going to give feedback on a, what we're calling a current soil landscape document to summarize sort of the resources that are out there right now around the soil data landscape, um, or a sort of visioning for what would it look like to build out a semantic toolkit for for soil data harmonization. Um, and with that, I think I am going to turn this over to Luis and um, take it away. Is that, that, qu quickly before that, does anyone have any questions on the process of what we're going to do today? Give people a chance to frantically type something in the chat and hit enter. No questions forthcoming. All right, take it away, Luis. Okay, thank you, Kate. So hopefully you are seeing my screen, my presentation, is that right? Good. Yes, we have you. Okay, good, good evening, everyone. Good morning, good afternoon, wherever you are in the world. Uh, thank you for inviting me for this session. I will be addressing you on this, on, vi on the vision for this incredible thing called CLOSE is the Global Soil Information System. So first of all, a few words on ISRIC, which I'm representing here today. Uh, for those that do not know, it's a foundation that was created 55 years ago in the Netherlands, um, much to the push of the United Nations and several uh, satellite institutions out the United Nations, uh, with a mandate to curate soil data but from a global perspective, not focused on any kind of national or regional perspective, but from a global uh, point of view. Uh, ISRIC in its first decade, it's pretty much dealt with physical things such as soil samples, soil monoliths, soil literature, maps, etc. But with the dawn of the digital age, it became more and more a digital uh, focused uh, institution with digital data, digital data services, uh, and yeah, uh, becoming more and more into that realm. ISRIC is today the World Data Center for Soils, accredited by the International Council for Science, and is involved in a number of international initiatives. Most relevant for tonight is the Global Soil Partnership. So what is the Global Soil Partnership? It's an initiative that started a decade ago. It's hosted at uh, FAO and it pretends to link all 
the national and regional institutions that curate soil information that are members of the United Nations. It's an initiative that is very focused on countries and empowering countries with tools and methods to um, develop a sustainable soil management. The Global Soil Partnership is subdivided in five pillars, focusing on five different domains. And this week is uh, primarily implicated in pillar four and pillar five. Pillar four uh, is the development of the so-called glo Global Soil Information System. And pillar five, uh, not the least important, concerns things as standardization, especially soil data standardization. So zooming a bit more now to GLOSIS itself. GLOSIS is being developed with a set of principles in mind. First of all, it needs to be something decentralized. What this means in practice is that it doesn't pretend to be just another uh, central infrastructure that replicates data that already exists out there in the world. It rather pretends to be a federated system where national regional institutions that somehow gather, collect and serve the soil data just join in in the network. An important aspect is always the country focus and the fact that some of the partners or maybe many of the partners uh, in the partnership do not have the resources that we have in the OECD countries. So the system needs to be something that is lightweight and affordable for, for every country to be able to, to join in. That also leads to a requirement for open source. So to free countries from license fees and other costs um and also based on principles like the the fair data principles to facilitate to have in mind that this data will be used by someone in the end of at the end of the day um this little slide just to show a little bit the interest that closes is generating um Glosolan is an initiative that is linked to the gsp targeting um, laboratory methods and laboratory uh, standards and some time ago, there was a survey conducted among the participants of the, uh, of the closal one. And there was a question that focused on this aspect and asked people if they were interested, they saw the value of a distributed information infrastructure and seeing that value, if they were willing to use something like that. And the answer was overwhelmingly positive to both questions. So lots of good intentions, but yeah, the world is not as simple. The world is a bit more complicated. And we have this nice metaphor here with uh, the power sockets in different places of the world. And by and large, soil information, soil science is a bit like this. And especially in large countries like the United States or Russia, Brazil, Argentina, China, People have their own perspective on soil and soil science, which is driven by the needs of countries of that size. And of course, then in the end, you have a, a, a landscape like this. So everyone seems to be doing things at their own way without much uh, consideration or, or, or interchange with what is happening uh, across the border or, or in the, uh, with their neighbors. And also something that we don't see here is that Actually, in some places, there are no, uh, no power plugs because the resources aren't there yet. And this is a, an important aspect of the Global Soil Partnership and clauses. So how do you solve this? Well, there's nothing, well, there's nothing much extraordinary about it, but basically it happens by adopting common standards. So to say a common language that everybody understands, that everybody can speak, and thus you create a, a, a network of institutions that use the same lang language to pass on this information, this knowledge to users. Uh, an early vision of how GLOSIS uh, works will be soon published by the GSP in this report. You can see the, the cover already, you cannot yet read it, but soon enough, that will be the case, I hope. Okay, talking a little bit more technical about closes uh, and especially the, the aspect here regarding standards. There are already many standards. Um, 
many of them issued by this institution, the Open Geospatial Consortium, that has been very successful, for instance, setting out standards for uh, web services. So GLOSIS needs to take into account that there is a body of work out there. It's not just about creating a new standard. No, it's much more about making existing standards uh, usable and practical. This is a very, uh, a very uh, high level overview of how GLOSIS is being conceived. It has three main components. First is what is called the GLOSIS node. That basically these are pieces of software hosted by the institutions that detain the data and wish to serve it. Then there is something called the discovery hub, which is a gateway for users that wish to find and interact with GLOSIS compliant nodes. And then perhaps the most important, a data exchange standard that all the GLOSIS nodes comply to. Well, this is happening also in baby steps. Uh, this is quite an ambitious uh, perspective that won't happen for sure overnight. And right now uh, within the project, it's being used as GLOSIS 1, GLOSIS 2 for the short and the long-term goals. In the short term, the concern are much more in empowering countries with the tools and the platforms they need to serve soil data. And then on a more longer term, the, imp the implementation of a soil standard that allows all these different nodes to speak the same language and join in in a common network. So once again, uh, the work on GLOSIS is happening. It's building up on a body of work that has been done uh, in soil science, but in other domains that, that are relevant. And especially the work that has been made by the OGC, especially with observations and measurement standards. Um, the soil quality standard from ISO that also sets out a domain model for soil data and other things like INSPIRE, which is kind of a, a younger brother of ISO. Uh, important work that has been conducted in Australia and, Ze and New Zealand now for a number of years that is quite relevant also for this work. And basically we are at the stage where mostly we need to translate this uh, abstract, these conceptual models of soil data into something that is practical. This can be made in different ways. At the moment, uh, the, the, the partnership is moving towards a semantic web-based uh, implementation of clauses. So we get here to a, a bit more technical, just to give, give an idea of what has been happening in clauses. Uh, this is a UML model that you cannot read, but anyway, that's not, that's not really important here. So in this boxes that to me, they appear pink, but yeah, pink or yellow. Um, in these boxes, we see the elements from the ISO standard. And these are things like, what is a soil profile? What is an horizon, etc. And this has been expanded in first place with soil properties, which are all these boxes in green that you see here that draw primarily from the FAO guidelines of soil description, and then further expanding with something really important, which are the code lists, basically the lists of values that fit in in each of these, in these properties uh, here in the model. And the model is being translated into a semantic web ontology. It's uh, being developed on or hosted at GitHub. So open development, you can check it out. Uh, you can okay, provide your feedback on GitHub if you will. And an early, early version of the ontology is available online at this uh, URL, uh, owl.closes.org, uh, where you can see uh, an early stage of the ontology. Some segments of it are already uh, somewhat stable, others they, they are changing quite fast but you can already use it even if you will. And you can also at closes.org have a look at, at the tools that are being set in place to help the countries with less resources uh, serve the data that they currently have. And that's all that I had to tell you tonight. Uh, if, if you wish uh, to know more about closes or to even to join um, this initiative, please get in contact with me or with my colleague Fanny van Herremond. That's all. Thank you for uh, for listening. Fantastic. It's always so exciting to hear what's going on with Glossus. Um, 
So I'm going to encourage people if they have a question to drop it in either the Slido or the chat, and we'll have some opportunities after everyone's gone around to um, to address them. Uh, I think I have Slido figured out now, and if you want to hop over to Slido and um, give some feedback to Luis, um, that would be appreciated. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Dylan, who I would love to have you help me with your last name there. Uh, I guess probably the easiest way is to think about those old Motel 6 commercials. Uh, so Bodet, yeah, hi everyone. Bodette. My name is Dylan Bodet. Um, Thank you. Yeah, apologies for the strange pronunciation for, for some folks. Anyways, um, let's see if I can do this. Um, we, we tried this ahead of time, sharing screens. Let's try it. Does that look right? No, it does. Yep. I'll we here see. You get the. We see the side notes, Dylan. We see your yeah, side notes. Matter. Oh, okay. Well, let's Which try one more. Yeah, you get to see my uh, funny comments to myself. Um, let's try one more time. Somehow that worked when we practiced. Hmm. Let's try this. Oh, Is that the same? Down. Yeah, no, no, no. Now we've got now we've got the the audience feel. Okay, well, thanks, Kathy, for the invitation, and thanks everyone for your attention. Um, I'm going to try and compress a lot into ten minutes, and I uh, and attempt to walk a very interesting line here of uh, simultaneously justifying the need for a complex system for describing soils information, and advocating for a simpler interface to soils information. So we'll see how that goes, where we end up. Um, could just be complete cognitive dissonance on my side. So um, I work for the uh, USDA NRCS, that'd be the Natural Resources Conservation Service, formerly the Soil Conservation Service. And for better or worse, we've been the sort of the, the caretakers of um, the US Soil Survey Program for about a hundred years here. Uh, we've We've poured tremendous resources into the effort. Many thousands of people have worked on these products and they really are the basis for our soil conservation programs, uh, planning and funding mechanisms. So it's, it's kind of a, a cornerstone of what the US Department of Agriculture, Agriculture does. And that said, despite all of this time and resources, we st still struggle quite a bit with uh, wrangling this complexity and making our data available and maybe most relevant to this discussion here, making those data kind of all work together. So there we go. Really, um, you know, from a scientist perspective, modeling the soil data should, should be simpler, but as any scientist or domain sort of expert specialist knows, you know, you can't oversimplify these things. Um, so really, for example, fusing soil morphology, laboratory characterization data, and spatial data is uh, conceptually a very simple process and probably a typical workflow. It doesn't have to be complicated, um, but I think one of our challenges, and ontologies provide an interesting avenue to address this, but one of the challenges is making sure that we offer people a route toward a simpler approach to fusing these data without losing all of the interesting nuance of the data, methods that were used to describe them and things like that, units of measure, you know, all the little details that can really get in the way of, of a, a useful result. So here's, here's a little funny thing. It turns out, um, you can do a lot of these things now if you're willing to dip into R or willing to dabble in SQL or willing to work with APIs and web services. And that's kind of a reoccurring theme of, of I think, where our agency is heading. Um, just a, a brief background on soil, soil survey data as, as I'm trying to represent this agency's sort of view of things. Uh, really, these are generalizations of reality. We're, we're trying to take these incredibly complicated, even complicated one-dimensional representations of physical and chemical properties and smash them into these boxes, these rectangles of 
you know, sort of administration, depth administrative units that allow us to, you know, simplify the system down to something that our that our minds can work with and that we can then scale on up to say entire nations or states. And then taking that from the profile on up to space and time, the landscape, really, if, if I was going to sort of describe the US soil survey program in one slide, this is it right here. And that it's an exercise in generalization that is a function of time. So our understanding of the world, our expectations of the landscape and the technology available and how that is, how this generalization is applied in, in space. So through geography and depth in data space and also, you know, how that really maps onto these kind of multivariate covariant structures that soil properties aren't random. They, they have pretty, um, well, they don't have perfect, but they have well understood relationships to, to each other that's, that are modified by the local climate or parent material, things like that. An example might be the soil pH and the, the what's something called base saturation, right? The, those nutrients that plants are after on the clay minerals. And so what we're doing here is we're, we're trying to come up with a system that, that allows us to generalize in space, to, to cut, cut the landscape into pieces according to, to geomorphology, management constraints, cut soil profiles up into individual horizons based on how those horizons are going to interact with, with energy and water and the addition of organic material and so on. So what, what we're grappling with in the US is a database that really is complex by design. These are detailed data that are, of course, they're generalizations, but it's still when you take one to 24,000 scale information for all of, say, the continental US or, or all 50 states of the US, as an example, um, it's a lot. And communicating that information to people, providing it in, a, um, in an efficient manner, but also meeting changing expectations of how people expect data to be delivered. It's, it's been a big challenge for us. And I think that we have a lot to learn from groups like this on how we can better uh, harmonize our internal collections and interface them with, with external collections. So just as a quick note, this, these, this is soil color. Um, these are essentially hand-drawn maps here. This is not remotely sensed data. You know, one of the biggest uh, hurdles to delivering, to, to getting our data out there is the fact that the use of soil survey information often relies, well, entirely relies on an understanding of some key definitions and concepts. There's a lot of jargon, pedons, genetic horizons, morphologic, morphologic descriptions. Um, this can sometimes get in the way of an effective use of these data, I think. Um, you know, some type of knowledge graph or semantic web ontology. You know, once that thing is is put together, I don't quite know what that would look like, but I'm I'm optimistic that that could help people understand what you know, find their way through some of this jargon. And you know, it gets it gets a little bit more complicated with the laboratory data or soil characterization data because you know these may not be referring to specific say depth intervals or specific genetic horizons. And a lot of the laboratory data are keyed to one of many possible different analytical methods. You know, there's many different ways to measure bulk density or a total elemental analysis or water retention. And so an ontology applied to, you know, analytical methods, um, you know, we've started tinkering with some of those things, but we, I think the US is a little bit behind in terms of using those tools. You know, boiling this all down, uh, soil survey in the United States is, is kind of an interface of, of a couple different things. It's not just a scientific product. It's, it's this like sort of messy mixture of, of administrative boundaries, physical entities, things that are measured or estimated, and then conceptual um, devices, things like soil landscape models or the soil series concept. These are incredibly useful concepts, um, but they don't necessarily relate perfectly, um, you know, to say laboratory characterization data that have been um, derived from a 50 centimeter or a, a 10 centimeter slice of, of data, you know, something like that, you know, and then we have these other things that are a little bit more US specific, but, um, you know, you find in a lot of na national soil survey systems, things like soil survey areas, 
uh, map sheets, uh, map units and components. And then kind of sitting at the heart of this here, I, I left that in there because I think it's important that soil taxonomy in many ways ties together a lot of what happens in, in the US soil survey. It may not be a, a tight control on, you know, what is sampled, where it's sampled, and what we ultimately call it, but it's, it's kind of an underlying framework that we use to sort things out. Again, I'm trying to compress a lot into this, into this one slide here, but, you know, the idea is that this wrangling, this kind of, uh, you know, this, this set of you know, administrative, physical, and conceptual entities, it leads to a lot of challenges, I think, with our data, you know. It's, it's both a strong point and a, a source of, of difficulty, of friction. So where are we going from here? Um, well, GitHub, it turns out, has been a tremendous resource for coordinating the development and documentation of analytical methods, R packages, just you name it. We're using it for all kinds of things. And um, I, I'd, I'd encourage anyone who's interested in following up or whatnot here. This is the kind of the active GitHub organization that we're working under right here, right now. NCSS stands for the National Cooperative Soil Survey. A quick example, um, R has, has been a game changer for our National Soil Survey program. Really, this is one of the, the most effective ways we've found to integrate spatial data, tabular data, temporal data, and abstract a lot of the, the kind of difficult but routine aspects of developing soil survey data and also delivering soil survey data. So for example, using just very few packages, a couple of commands, it's possible to uh, develop thematic maps of gridded soil data for some arbitrary place in the United States with, you know, I don't want to say a couple lines of code, but I want to say, you know, under under 40 lines of code, and that includes commentary and, you know, extra carriage returns for clarity and stuff like that. Uh, we're starting to push out into the realm of gridded soil properties and classes and interpretations. Um, we, we haven't we're not quite as far along as I'd like, but we have a number of products out there right now, both through cooperators, um, starting to push some stuff on up to Google Earth Engine. That has been, I think, a bit of a stumbling block for us, not having our products up there for other people to use. And then really, uh, I guess it boils down to meeting some of these challenges and expectations. Um, it's, it's gonna come down to um, upgrading, enhancing our existing products, the development of new products, um, switching a lot of our efforts toward APIs and web services. And some of these acronyms were in uh, Luis's talk, uh, really embracing open source software and standards, I think is absolutely critical. Maybe a little bit more psychological or uh, the social aspect of this is really making soils data more relevant. Those soil color maps or soil profile sketches and plain language narratives have uh, have been more, have, had been um, a little bit more beneficial than we expected them to be. And I think that that means that we'd been kind of ignoring the, the social aspect of, of making these data relevant. Um, in the end, really, we, we've got a lot of room for improvement. And I, I do think that uh, working with groups like this on controlled vocabularies and ontologies uh, might, might be a way that we can uh, get past some of these challenges. So I'll, I'll finish up with the uh, XKCD comic that seems appropriate here. All right, so let's leave this up for a beat. I always love XKCD. Um, and and uh, if you wanna hop over to the Slido, there's a set of questions um, for Dylan about uh, soil data service. Um, and with that, um, thank you again. We're gonna hold questions until the panel discussion. So pop over to Slido and drop something in the Q&A or, or feel free to type it into the chat and we'll capture that. And with that, um, Megan, why don't uh, you <laughs> take us to New Zealand? So we've gone from Europe to America, oh. and, I'm sorry, <clears throat> Australia, not New Zealand. For Australia. Some reason, I have mapped yeah. you to New Zealand <laughs> and right. while Kiwis are wonderful, <laughs> Um, you are an Aussie. All right. Yes. Yep. Um, can you hear me and see the slide? We can hear you and see your slide deck. 
looking uh, good. Excellent. Um, yes, thanks for, um, thanks for having us. Um, it's a bit of a presentation of um, folks on the ground um, grappling with the challenges of delivering soil data um, for a system called uh, Visualising Australasia Soils uh, Mostly. Um, we're collecting data from or working with our farmer groups and catchment management authorities. So touching through a lot of the um, challenges that we have particularly and um, solutions. Um, and it's a bit, of a bit of a think about how the global soil community can help folks on the ground like us. So these are the projects that um, this work draws from. And thank you to all the um, collaborators on our pro these projects. So I'm presenting the work from um, a soil CRC initiative mostly um, called Visualising Australasia Soils. And these are all the, um, it's uh, involving a number of farming groups and management authorities and research organisations. So for, oh, sorry, I'm just saying something funny. I'm sorry, I'm saying something funny here at my end. Don't, don't mind me. So the, um, so we underwent some social research for VAS and we collected our user experiences that was scoped to deliver um, for the use cases of farming systems groups and catchment management authorities. And we found that the user experiences fell under three broad categories and they were flexible search and discovery, mostly to see trends across time and space and for me, um, to fulfill their communication and reporting requirements, to inform decision-making um, with data that can be easily interpreted and particularly that the um, data was in, interpretable in context. There was a concern about that. It really needed, the data needed context. And also that the system needed to be able to fill um, an organi their organisational um, data management gaps. So the brief to be able to fulfil these requirements were basically that we needed to um, be able to build an interoperable spatial knowledge system that provided all these CRC participants and the broader ag industry um, with access to um, data and information about their own local soils and um, soils across Australia. So um, the current state um, basically was that these data providers didn't have at all the systems and capacities that they needed to be able to store and serve their data, um, discover and reuse their data through um, the VAS system. So our or through any system. So our task was to take all this varying data content um, and formats from the different data providers and make it available in ways that um, could be reused. So um, we to deliver in a standard format standard content and via a standard mechanism. So basically to make data more fair because they didn't have their own solutions. Um, uh, we utilized the approach was a, a data aggregation approach within the broader, uh, a broader VAS federated system. So grower groups, if they chose to and CMAs could um, provide their data submit their data to us, would interpret it, transform it and load it into the system, integrate and harmonize it and help deliver on their user cases. So uh, this had to be backed by a standards-based approach. So um, a brief overview of the standards employed for the description, storage and harmonization and serving out of the soil data. Um, the data is mapped, um, mapped and storage is uh, basically O and M based. So we separate, separated out these various classes, for example, the result and procedures to make the observation and the soil features that the observations were being made on. And the data is served out as, um, uh, can be served out as JSON-LD using uh, basically uh, SOSA and SSN and ontology and open API. Um, must point out as well that this is experimental at this um, stage, not fully compliant. And um, Andrew McLeod, I noticed is here today. So any questions around um, services, you might want to flick him, flick him uh, a question.
So just quickly, um, a quick look at the user interfaces so we can get into some of the challenges. Um, so now users can search and view, for example, by location and feature such as saw body or layer and then sort by property, procedure, unit of measure, etc. And these are all um, described with uh, controlled vocabularies. So uh, we're working on graphing at the moment um, to meet the user cases and their operate, um, the grower group's operational requirements. At the moment, we, you can filter by, um, here's an example, we can filter by depth and over time and some visualization and coloring. I think that's pH there. So some of the main, um, well, the main challenge we encountered um, was just the huge variety in the data that we received. So keeping in mind, we was asking for, just hand us your data um, and we'll make it interoperable. So <laughs> here's some of the challenges we encountered. So, uh, he, well, the variety, it was my, that we most received things in Excel, but there was some PDFs, database dumps. There was various vintages of data. There was data from all different domains, uh, including biological and I saw profile observations. There was different experimental designs and factors, repeated measures over time, different depths, no standardization in um, depth and lots of different sampling me methods, regimes and sample types, but they were very rarely, um, we never really get much information about it from um, the data providers within the data set. So um, the standards-based approach that O&M helped, um, helped deal to an extent with some of these um, challenges. So um, just a quick look at some of the um, control terms we used um, with the simplification. You can see the basic O&M design patterns and in yellow, some of the controlled terms that we use. Uh, for things such as observable properties, procedures, relationship types and roles, uh, results and results where they're classifiers, as well as um, a control vocab table um, for units of measure. So, oh, now what are this one of the, so the major, one of the major challenges we fa uh, faced was that um, there was multiple, we needed to we needed to express, there was lots of different relationships um, between features. We needed to relate the observations to each other over time. So there's relationships between the observations, lots of features. We needed to relate the features to each other as well and um, spatial sampling features. Um, so we needed to be able to relate these together in a flat Excel spreadsheet. And added to that, we had the challenge of inconsistent labeling from the data providers, which made this challenging. Um, site, sample naming, georeferences, et cetera, were inconsistent often. Um, so our solution at this point is, or, that we use were vocabularies to describe the feature and um, the feature relationships and the roles. And procedures were really a particular challenge. So, um, yeah, describe, uh, they were often just are not included, they weren't included, or there was um, the same results were, observations were made um, from, from results from different laboratories, historical data, the labs change over time, etc. their procedures change over time. There was calculations that were ad hoc um, inconsist and inconsistent. And our solution was to map to where, so mapping these was a real um, challenge to control vocabularies. So we tried to map to the highest resolution that, um, that we could, um, ideally a national standard, but right down to an un undocumented procedure. So the challenges we um, faced um, applying control vocabularies were that we had, um, were, you know, started off as novices in, well, me personally in this area, say three years ago. So the discoverability was um, a challenge of the vocabularies. Uh, we had limited national and international terms. We got standards, but 
um, making them available as controlled vocabulary terms. So working with national agencies to get those up. Um, procedures were challenged, non-standard and poorly documented and ongoing governance and usefulness of these were really uh, pro problematic. Um, and the ongoing maintenance and governance of vocabularies um, in general. So we established them, not necessarily determining the roles, rights and responsibilities of them, but governing them into the future, particularly um, for project specific, uh, ones that may only have a life within this project. Um, and upskilling of uh, staff, um, in semantics and semantic technologies. So we relied on user interfaces. Um, we use, re so just on control vocabs, we use, reuse them where possible, use national standards. And there's a link to the Australian New Zealand um, persistent identifiers that we're getting up. And as a last resort, we have to create our own federation, university, or um, project-specific control vocabularies. And ongoing work and considerations. So it's mostly around um, phase two, which runs to 2023, is mostly around um, continued outreach and education to um, the users and piloting a self-serve interface um, with a metadata questionnaire at the front. Um, we're finding because the data sets come in with very little metadata. Um, that we require, um, users require licensing education. Um, we're trialing a spreadsheet template, how users can, um, pushing some of the responsibilities back onto the users to be able to learn how to label their own data, and take a bit of the pressure off um, the researchers ourselves having to interpret the data and upload it. Um, so that's basically reducing, shifting a bit of the transaction costs while, while trying to really maintain the value of the system. So getting that cost benefit right. Um, yeah, so in that sense, also we're working in, on um, how we can maximize the reuse value of the data with um, tooling visualisation, et cetera. And of course, there's data quality and provenance considerations, which we haven't touched on at this phase um, with grower group and catchment management data. It might become more of an issue if, and um, as moving forward, we may end up dealing with more research data from the other CRC participants. So that's it. That's it from me. Some of our, a, a quick overview of our challenges. There's a real lot more, which I could, you know, you could spend all day on. So um, I think the question, my, you know, main questions in the Slido is how, how can the global soil community um, help users on the ground, implementers like ourselves, um, work to make our, work to make our uh, data more reusable, interoperable with the global system while maintaining that um, the, the value to the users on the ground. Fantastic. Well, thank you, Megan. Um, as she said, there's some questions in Slido um, for her. And <laughs> Dress, uh, Dylan, Dylan commented accurately that addressing all this in 10 minutes is uh, challenging. So I'm going to encourage people to come and join us for the Soil Ontology and Informatics Cluster. Um, we've been meeting every other week for one hour and we alternate time zones between uh, New Zealand, or I've got New Zealand on the mind, Australian friendly and European friendly time zones. So uh, we're, we're trying to lower barriers to entry. All right, thank you all for a really interesting um, conversation. Again, uh, questions can go in Slido or in chat. Um, and as folks are typing up their questions, um, we are a small enough group that uh, I'm gonna go through the questions that have been written down first, and then um, I'll, I'll open the, mic, the, the mics up and we can do some popcorning. Um, to, to, to talk with the panelists here. So um, the first question I have here is for Luis. 
um, is glo the glosis ontology generated from the UML model directly? So what's the relationship between um, glosis and what role does the UML um, play in that framework? The answer to that is, uh, well, it's always never a straightforward answer, but to the great extent, yes. To a great extent, it has been uh, a translation from the UML into a semantic web ontology. It's mm -hmm. not, I don't think it's possible to really do it uh, cleanly, uh, so to say, at the click of a, of a button, but to a great extent, yes. Okay. I don't know um, is there if, a follow up on that question? Go for it, Simon. I saw you clicking. Yeah, it was off. me that it was me that typed the the question. Um, uh, hi, Louise. Um, hi, so I, I suppose the one of the tensions is the extent to which, in the OWL and RDF context, that you're leveraging. Um, other standards coming in from which 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 weren't necessarily part of the original UML model, right? Right, right. So in the UML, okay, I guess you know this better than me, but anyway, in the UML, <laughs> <laughs> in the UML, of course, uh, we have references to observations and measurements, and then when we come down to OWL, uh, we have references to SOSA, to GeoSparkle, right? And we try to keep it, um, yeah, but it's as close as possible. It's not, it's not uh, a one-to-one -one relationship, but it's pretty close, I would say. So the 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 the, the, ma the matrix, the template, as Megan was saying, is pretty much the same. It's also in the web ontology. All right, we've got one more question for you louise um what is the most difficult thing with standardizing soil informatics across different countries is there um yeah and then there is there an example that you can come up with with this international standardization example? well i think i think if we look at this specific domain of soil i don't think it's it's really the problem is not really from the computer science because we have these templates, I hope this is clear to everybody. These templates, like ops that we talk about, observations and measurements, SOSA, ISO two eight two five eight. They give us a template, a template on how do you you should organize your data. The problems, I, th I think, at least, and of course for me, I'm coming from computer science, not from soil science. Is the things that Megan fairly well highlighted in her, in her presentation. Things like okay, let's make a vocabulary of procedures. That's a big challenge. That's, that really is a challenge. And I, I'm, I'm doing something very similar to what Megan has done in the context of GLOSIS. And for instance, to, to find bibliographic references for the methods that soil scientists use on a daily basis is a challenge. So they are using things that are not maybe not so well documented out there but everybody uses everybody in the, in the domain knows what it is but when you want to put it down in an ontology uh, make it something standardized it's a challenge uh, and i would say that's that's the, the the difficulty we have at at the moment uh, so from the computer science part i don't see really that big of a, of a problem i would say i hope that that is clear enough I would happen to agree with you. I don't know if Megan and Dylan had different opinions on that. Yeah, the um, the procedures were are a real particular problem we're finding. Um, you don't know whether you've got the same thing or a different thing. People describe them in all different ways. Um, they describe the headers with, you know, observable properties or procedures. You've got to try and determine what it is they're labeling their data with. And um, challenge we've come up with recently is, for example, soil features, a whole bunch of different soil features that we use here in Australia from the uh, national standards, which um, may or may not be the same thing as the GLOSIS terms that you're using so do we use this national one or do we use closest um you know global terms i guess how you know enabling us you know the tooling and ontology to be able to map 
map over, you know, across some um, countries is a really valuable thing. If I, if I could add something quickly, just to another perspective or another challenge or kind of where we're at. Um, we have we have a large body of standards and laboratory method manuals and you know a lot of what we've done and the way in which we correlate all these different so soil surveys is is fairly well documented unfortunately it's not in the form of of an ontology or a knowledge graph or controlled vocabulary kind of like what everyone here has in mind so one of our challenges right now is translating word documents and pdfs and printed documents and you know volumes like soil taxonomy into sort of this hybrid human and machine readable format that we can then kind of mold into what we're all talking about here. And, um, you know, we're, I think we're lucky he's, he's not on the call today, I don't think, but, you know, a fellow in the office here, Andrew Brown, has, has really pushed that quite a ways forward. And so I'm hoping that, that he'll be able to, to demonstrate some of that here soon, and that, that should be showing up on some of our uh, GitHub repositories. But... Um, it is interesting that he, adapting these paper and kind of old electronic records into an ontology in some ways is, is just as hard as inventing a new one. Um, there's just a lot of inertia. You know, this Simon is uh, per, uh, dropping a couple of links in the chat around the green book and uh, looks like a, a schema um, registry as well for the CISRO Australian terms. Um, Dylan, uh, Kai is dropping a, a suggestion for, do you wanna unmute uh, Kai and uh, flesh that out a little bit? Oh, no worries. I just wanted to say that there are some technical solutions for, there's more than just the one I put the link to, of course, and Simon and other Mark Schildhauser could speak to this as well. There's, there's different solutions for making RDF or OWL from tabular formats, which would kind of help expedite that process that you're discussing. Um, but I don't want to say too much more. I don't want to take everyone's time. I just have a quick question. I joined a couple minutes late into the presentation, so I was just wanting to know for in the QQ chat, like, is this document something that is internal to just this event, or is it something that we can share, or I'm just not sure I missed those parts of the discussion. Um, the notes document for the session itself? Yes, those notes. That is an excellent question that I am going to check bar. Can you message one of the ESIP coordinators that question? Um, we'll get uh, yeah, you can you, oh, hello. Yeah, can Excellent. you repeat it just so I got it right? <laughs> yeah, just wanted to make sure if like the session notes that I'm seeing people add to in the QQ chat, if those are internal only for this event or if they're open to share or like what this, what the, I don't know what to do with them. <laughs> yeah, great. Yeah, I should have that answer in just a couple seconds. So great. Excellent. Thank you, Barb. Um, any additional questions? I'm learning to sit with silence on Zoom calls so that people can. So I just on. wanted to, to Go I just for plug, it, Kat. plug one more thing. So the, the semantic harmonization cluster, the ESIP semantic harmonization cluster, we focus particularly on trying to bridge different um, ontology and standards and harmonize across systems. So our previous work has been um, between ESIP suite ontology, uh, now governed by ESIP, and the environment ontology ENVO, and doing some working on some mappings and, and cross work there in reference to cryosphere um, relevant concepts. And we're kind of moving on now towards more um, fire and disaster semantics. But if this is of interest, um, I just want to plug that we do exist. Um, we are trying to harmonize these things. Um, some of the people on this call might be familiar with it. It's a bit slow work. It takes a long time to do these things, but I think one of the challenges you guys keep describing sounds a lot like the harmonization of, you know, methods and vocabularies across many different systems. It sounds like 
there's three good ones starting to emerge and it would be great to harmonize targets there. So maybe in the future, um, that could be a point of collaboration between our cluster and uh, the, this one. And uh, just to comment on that, um, we're really finding a crossover with, um, for example, the biological sciences, as you get more into the um, and biological ontologies, as you get more into describing um, soil biology. Uh, so the, the number of collections and ontologies that we're using to describe observable properties particularly is, um, yeah, almost growing out of control with the variety of data that we're getting in. Um, so leveraging the work of other domains and aligning with those would be really valuable. Okay, we have a, an answer back from ESIP uh, staff. That's, it, this is the Kiko chat, right, that we're asking? Yeah, well, we can yeah, see the so notes. Megan thinks that that is not saved externally that she's aware of, so we would have to save it ourselves. Ashley, were you referring to the Kiko chat or the Word document that's embedded in the Kiko chat? Uh, the, it's the not the chat, sorry. It's the Word document. Thank oh, you the Word the document. Yes, that that will be saved. Yes. The, is that, that publicly of is that publicly available? Uh, yes. Okay, I will relay that particular question <laughs> and get back. Sorry, thanks. <laughs> New to the QCO chat world, so thanks. <laughs> oh yeah, no, my, myself included. I'm like, I don't actually know how this exactly is all working, but I believe it's going to be publicly available, but let me get a confirmation on it's that. It's a Google Doc and they are publicly visible right. at the moment. It's just a question of how long they're going to be preserved. I think that's right. a yeah, key great. question. That, and how wide, how widely ESIP um, is circulating, is, is allowing them to be circulated or, or suggesting that they be circulated. All right, so I so we're moving into the the, the feedback portion of the the talk. If unless anybody has additional questions, all right. So um, I am going to suggest I'm going to open up two different breakout rooms. Um, and if you go to the bottom of the Google Notes, there are um, a feedback breakout room slide deck. There are uh, two suggestions for topics of discussion for the breakout rooms. Um, one is to look at this document that we're uh, that I'm calling current soil data landscape. Um, it's sort of a, a compilation of resources that are available um, that would be useful for the types of uh, uh, endeavors that we've been hearing about today in session. Um, and then the second one is it's a little bit self-serving. Um, I'm looking to integrate research data for um, uh, okay, Barr has a, a reply in the chat. The Google Doc will be visible to all and will be attached to the schedule after the meeting. So, Ashley, I think that that is a yes. You can yes. copy and send this around. Please do. Yes. Thank and you. the recordings will also be available. I believe those are available August 10th. So. That's the same date that I got on a different question on the ESIP YouTube channel. Great. <laughs> so we're getting the same answer. That's a good thing. <laughs> this is all we're triangulating here. So <laughs> there's a coordinated plan, a method to the madness that the someone Susan's has. Susan's in charge. There's a good plan. <laughs> all right. Um, so, so the first one was feedback on that document. And then the second breakout group, I um, will be talking a little bit more about uh, standing up um, a soil data hackathon to integrate these one-off data sets um, that are coming out of the research community. Um, so a little, a slightly different beast than the soil survey data I'm realizing now, uh, but th thinking about developing those vocabularies that maybe capture some of that domain knowledge that Luis was talking about um, in a way that is um, formalized and reusable. 
And with those vague instructions, I am going to, I think I can do this. I can do this. I'm only going to make two breakout rooms. Two, let participants choose. Create, I'm gonna rename one. Current resources. I'm going to rename the second one um data hacking so if anyone has uh ideas about how to proceed forward as a community around data integration creating semantic tools uh things along those lines um that is sort of what the second breakout is about and then the first one is uh resource compilation um, and with that, I'm going to open the breakout rooms. I'm going to give us uh, 15 minutes um, and then we'll come back and recap and uh, talk about next steps. Um, so we've got 13 committed folks. Um, and uh, yeah. All right, cool. Um, so uh, I knew what my room was talking about. What were you guys talking about? Anyone want to report out from room one? You no, know you have to report out there, Kathy. You got you got to lead lead by example. Oh wait. Well, yeah, wait. All right. So so for the soil, I'll start kick off the soil data hacking. Um, so for the, the data hacking group, we uh, sort of circled a little bit about thinking how we can try to build some kind of semantic integration and harmonization across these different projects. Um, Kai was somewhat encouraging in that standing up sort of small groups to look at individual measurement types um, is unlikely to be a waste of time. Uh, so that is what, where I think we're going to go move forward. So Margaret has joined me in this um, insanity and has uh, agreed to um, uh, the, the words backing up, looking at bulk, starting with bulk density. Going to move on to other other measurements, um, and hopefully we'll create something that's sort of a, a, a small seed for an ontology. Um, in the next year. So stay tuned. We'll see what happens next summer. Did I miss anything aside from it's the end of the day and I apologize for scatterbrainedness. Although Louise, you're, you're definitely have me beat on late nights here. Oh, yeah. I saw the sentiment passing by a while ago. <laughs> <laughs> I just kind of wanted to reiterate that, you know, in the in the life sciences, the reason why we were able to get a unified understanding of, you know, what genes do what across different species was because people came together and built the gene ontology. And so the zebrafish gene doing X and the fly gene doing X were now labeled the same way. So we could, you know, have a better understanding and that coalesced into the largest ontology in the life sciences. So I think just, you know, getting people across the pond, across the oceans to agree Soil horizon B in Australia means what versus the one in America? Is it the same? Is it not? How are they different? Documenting all of that is what is needed to build something like a global informatics ontology. I don't know, maybe Dr. Cox can better explain, but that's my understanding. Kai, do you mind me asking one additional question on that? Is what do you do when you have two strong superpowers that both have something called the nay horizon and they don't match? And you create an ontology where you generalize the most specific, the most, the least specific concept is on top. And then you make children classes that are why, like a class that's slightly more specific. So, so parent is, you know, has four legs and goes meow. Child is, has four legs and goes meow and is made of metal. And that's how you differentiate a robotic cat from a real cat or, or something like that. It's a goofy example. But the point being that you can create nodes within the ontology that are all exactly what it is meant to be and then you name each one or link each one to you know whose version is saying what so maybe the australian one is something specific and the american one is one level of abstraction up but it's you know it's missing one little thing and then we can understand the machine can understand what the difference between the two is 
or at least and, and at, the, at the end of Kai's uh, explanation there I, he 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 was homing in on something very important which is when something is coming from a different place you need to label it that it's coming from a different place there's names are scoped names are scoped to 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 the community that coined them and just because the the tail end of the name is the same as one from somewhere else it you know because the scope's different it means something different thanks much more eloquent than i was flailing for um does someone want to talk about what went on in the first brit in the uh, other breakout room Simon, do you want to say anything? I, th I think you were the most <laughs> person in that session. After a bit of stumbling around, I, I, I took over the conversation, Kathy. Um, but, but primarily, I was trying to, you know, we were talking about existing resources there. And um, it, I was intrigued at, at teasing out, in particular, um, the the different um, sort of use cases that were driving the presentations that we'd heard before, um, um, and uh, Dylan's uh, was describing to us why the broad scale data delivery thing was important for for them. Megan was explaining um, why the detailed um, data capture um, use case was driving some of the decisions there where they're dealing with individual um, property owners, farmers. Um, and um, Luis um, had a, you know, a, a third sort of orientation, which is um, the global community, in particular those who aren't yet, uh, don't have systems in place, um, less, less developed. Um, and the, the assistance to them. And so we had really had three very different use cases, but uh, clearly some interest in, um, uh, in, in taking those existing resources and, and being able to talk about them the same way. That was me taking over though. Sorry about that, Gareth. Thank you, Simon. <laughs> <laughs> I think I'll throw a fourth use case into the mix there, which is experimental data. Um, so from, from single PIs, which is sort of the, my not so subtle um, driving force to, with this cluster is to try to figure out how to get um, those data structures. And that has more nuances around experimental mm -hmm. treatment, sampling design, um, things along those lines that are not I'm, I'm realizing are less parallel with the soil survey and, and monitoring data sets that a lot of a lot of you guys are coming in with. So, yeah, really interesting diverse use cases here. All right, we're coming up at time. I'm going to put a plug in for the um, soil ontology and informatics cluster. Um, we're, we're not meeting next week, but we are picking back up in August. Um, so August 11th, I believe is our next meeting and, um, it will be a sort of retrospective. What have we done this year? What's worked well? What do we need to tweak and how are we moving forward? So, um, everyone would be invited to that. 